front runner. I'm talking to Roger Eldridge of the Family Rights and Responsibilities Institute and we were just about to outline how the Constitution protects the rights of families. Roger, it's yours. Okay. As I was saying, anyone can buy it. This is actually uh, an older version. There's a new version of this in a much more uh, royal blue uh, colour. But the wording is, is, is the same. I mean, in the section, I think it starts at Article 40, where it's dealing with fundamental rights. Uh, it talks about all people being equal before the law as human beings. That doesn't mean, you know, uh, it also says that, you know, where there's a difference in social function or capacity, then we are different and we should be treated as different. It's okay to treat us as different. <clears throat> so if I'm a married person and you're not a married person I could be treated differently from you and if why you're, is that? if you're a man and I'm a woman we can be treated differently because we have different capacities okay so mm. we can be treated differently there's a lot of talk about equality uh, and, and basically saying that apples and oranges should be treated the same where well, there's no basis in law for that and certainly isn't any basis in the Constitution. The Constitution would say completely the opposite. And is it just capacities which distinguish? Is it, no, is it social more functions? Yeah. So, uh, and, and so, you know, whether a person has a duty and another person doesn't have a duty, obviously they would have different rights. Yes. Because you cannot, you cannot fulfil your duty unless you have the right to do it. Okay, well, so I suppose it's it's uh, say it's good to outline the duties and responsibilities that are pertinent to a family. How would you like that? Okay, well, the next article deals with the family uh, explicitly. It's actually titled The Family. And it talks there about the family being an institution, and it talks about it being a moral institution. Now, that's very important because the whole constitution Ireland uh, is based on Christian principles and I think that is what most of us even if even people who are not Christian they still have a sense of right and wrong and therefore the Constitution uh, is very valuable and useful for them as well uh, but the the family has been in existence uh, long before the state came into existence and that is recognized in the Constitution that the uh, and because of that and because it's such a fundamental unit group of society it has it has its own uh, uh, authority and its own constitution that the state can't interfere with the idea is that Basically, I think uh, it's been described, Ireland has been described as being like a, a, a sea full of little independent republics. And that's what each individual family is. They're all individual little uh, sovereign states, if you like, where the decisions are made by the husband and wife working together for the benefit of all the people in the family. That's each other and the children. And the state doesn't have any any uh, power to interfere with any of those decisions or to uh, impose its dogma or, or, or will on any of those families. So then outline for us, please, what is the relationship of the state to the family? The state uh, acknowledges the importance of the family and its independence. And that, that without it, the state and the society would be, you know, the common good, so to speak, could not be properly achieved. And so the state pledges in the Constitution, these are the exact words, it pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of the family founded on marriage and to protect it from attack. Now that's a very interesting phrase. That was written in 1937. What sort of attacks do you think it envisaged? Well, I mean, it was written by, uh, you know, uh, people at the time. De Valera was uh, t 
Taoiseach of the country. Uh, and he'd been to America, he'd been to England extensively. He'd seen what the states were doing in those two countries and how they were basically trying to steamroller their views over the family. And so in the, in the Irish constitution, uh, there is this pledge that the that attack from the state is impermissible, not allowed. Now that, all laws in Ireland, as everybody knows, must be in full conformity with the Constitution and the rights that people have in the Constitution. And what's happened uh, in the last 50 years, by stealth, and now this is a very serious charge that I'm making here, is that without the people being at all uh, aware of it and without the people actually asking for it, the powers that be that, that have taken over the country, that they have little by little implemented laws to do with the family and to do with children that allow the state to actually get in inside the family and supervise the family and start to bring the family round into a position where they are, they are uh, being told what to do by the state, which is entirely the opposite of what they've pledged to do in the Constitution. And is there a perceptible technique by which they go about this? Well, uh, there is. I mean, the, the, you know, the people basically only know what the laws are by being told by you know, commentators, by the media, uh, by their own TDs, what those laws are and how they should be used. And particularly, people are very vulnerable when they get somehow dragged into law situations, into court situations. They then rely on, on a solicitor who they pay an awful lot of money to, to give them proper legal advice. Now, the vast majority of people that come to us have been to a solicitor, have paid a solicitor a lot of money, and have found that the solicitor has actually acted entirely contrary to their interests, and especially the interests of their children. And most of the people have sought the use, the, 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 the employment of a solicitor to actually protect their children. And they found that the solicitor has not done the best job that they could uh, for, to protect their children. And so when they come to us and they find out what the law actually is supposed to do and what the state is supposed to do, they are amazed. They are absolutely shocked. Because it's, it's, it's almost always like 180 degrees, the opposite of what they actually have been led to believe it is. Is it possible, Roger, that people actually are ignorant of the law and of the rights and duties that they hold? No, I, I, they're not. And this is, this is a very common theme that come, people are shocked when, when they, their first encounter with the law, they truly go into, into a situation where they're dealing with the law with the expectancy, right. the expectation that the law is there to protect people who act right. So it's the opposite. They are, in fact, uh, cued in to what the law is, and it's this shock that brings them to you. They has, that's right. Yeah. They have common sense. Yes. They have, they have a, 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 an instinctive knowledge that some things are right and some things are wrong. Mm -hmm. And so when they encounter the law as it's put to them by solicitors, by court staff, by the media even, uh, it, they, it's all counterintuitive. They, they, they literally cannot believe it. They cannot understand it. And therefore, it's very hard for them to cope with it. They are very distressed. Everybody that goes in a situation where 
something bad is being done to their children and their family and they expect the courts to actually do their job and side with them. Yes. I mean, everybody thinks on a very simple level that, you know, a little rhyme that we all know when we're children carries on throughout life and that is that cheats never prosper. Okay? And when, you know, uh, wives see their husbands cheating and husbands see their wives cheating and the courts actually siding with them, that is a terrible blow to them. And when they see their children being very badly harmed by this, that is devastating. And why do you think uh, the principles of law are hidden from what could only be a process that people enter into when they enter into family law? Is it a process? Some sort of a, um, a conveyor belt of, uh, of one event after the other, which is totally, just totally ignores law altogether and just, you know. Well, that, that cheats never prosper. Is, is actually a very, you know, that's a maxim of law where the law is applied in a moral way. Yes, okay. Now what they've done in the last 50 years by stealth, they've introduced the Guardianship of Infants Act, they've introduced the Maintenance Act, they've introduced the Domestic Violence Act, they've introduced the Judicial Separations Act, they've introduced the Divorce Act. Well, now, you say none, of, none, of, none of these laws, i just explain that none of these laws are moral in the way that people understand them to be. None of them require the, the person that, that goes to the court as the, as the applicant to, to, to have make allegations of misconduct on the, other, on the part of the other spouse. Yes, so I just them. want to pick you up on that, Roger. You say introduced. Obviously, there were laws covering these areas before the last 50 years. That's right. So what happened? That's right. Whilst they were introducing the so-called uh, law reform pieces of legislation, they repealed. They actually abolished and put out of, out of reach all the laws that people had relied on for centuries. So you're saying that the laws that preceded these family law reforms were moral? They were moral and they were what, what you call adversarial, in that the person who was the uh, applicant was claiming that the other person had done uh, bad things and the other person was required to defend themselves against those allegations. And so there was a uh, an accusation and defence going on that, uh, that 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 people could actually observe. It was all all done in public. Uh, the people could observe, and so people could see that whenever a spouse behaved badly, when they committed adultery, when they uh, were cruel, when they deserted, that that they were punished. That there was the, and, and, and there would be a stigma about that person from that point onwards. And how does that differ to the way those, let's say, accusations might exist in, in modern day family law reforms? Surely there are such accusations levied against spouses from time to time. All that's, re all that's left of that time now is a, is a myth. Uh, you know, 